Admiral Wisecup, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Admiral Roughhead, faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here today in the very short time that since I've begun work as 75th Secretary of the Navy, I've been continually impressed with the dedication and the talent that I found in our professional officer corps, starting with an exceptional CNO, Gary Ruffhead. <laughs> Admiral Ruffhead brings more value than you know. Uh, first time my wife and I went and had dinner with Admiral Nellen, um, they provided uh, their daughter Elizabeth as a babysitter for our eight-year-old. I think Elizabeth is still recovering from that. <laughs> I do have to tell you that I never dreamed I'd be standing here when I started my naval service nearly four decades ago as a junior surface warfare officer, as Admiral Wisecup said, on the USS Little Rock right here in Newport, Rhode Island. I didn't think I would be standing here today when I was on special sea and anchor detail going out under the $2 bridge. <laughs> that was a $2 bridge in 1970. And they still haven't upped the uh, toll as far as I can tell. Early on, early on as the JG, I saw the sacrifices and the difference that service members made every day to defend and serve our country. I carried that memory and the commitment to service I gained through all the years since and through service as a governor, as an ambassador. On Thursday at the Washington Navy Yard, I'll rejoin the Navy at my public swearing in. I'm proud of that first tour of duty on a cruiser and proud beyond words to return home to the Department of the Navy. I'm glad to see this group, this strong participation, for as you think through the important issues of our age, you represent the latest in a long and strong line. The list of notable Naval War College alumni reads like an honor roll of Naval history. Mahan, Nimitz, Halsey, Bliss, King, each came here to Coasters Harbor Island, the shores of Narragansett Bay, and they were joined by many more whose contributions to history, and those contributions are invaluable, was that they served and fought and thought for this nation. For more than 115 years, the intellectual product here has been a powerful tool and has helped lead our nation to prevail through two world wars, through the long twilight struggle with communism, and continues today. The thought and the theory which came from here aren't relegated unused to musty shelves. What has made them so successful and so potent is that they're implemented by a unique combination of assets and skills that the Navy and the Marine Corps bring. Now, I know we've got other services, other nations in this audience, but I'm going to brag on the Navy and the Marine Corps. This naval force is the most agile, the most flexible, and the most responsive force ever fielded. We are always forward deployed, always the away team like the cop who walks the beat, ready to respond to whatever situation presents itself. Whatever the president needs on behalf of this nation, we've got the tools and we've got the talent to do it. Alfred Thayer Mahan taught here, and he taught about the importance of maritime presence in shaping world affairs. His seminal work, The Influence of Sea Power on History, has informed more than a century of strategy. But that strategy is carried out by the Navy and Marine Corps has proved adaptable and adjustable 
to meet changing world realities. If you'd been in this room 20 years ago, just before the wall came down, and you made a thoughtful analysis of the challenges we would face in 2009, most likely every one of them would have been wrong. If you were to come back 10 years later, 1999, and done the same good, deep analysis, it most likely would have been more wrong than right. And as you sit here today, and you plan for the future, even the most informed and analytical debate imaginable, the odds are, over the next two decades, we'll face threats and challenges which we cannot see today. And that's why the Navy and the Marine Corps working together as a team is so critical to our nation's security. We're nimble, we're responsive, and we don't have to go home and get our gun. We take it with us. Aircraft on deck, missiles in the tubes, Marines embarked with their gear, ready for whatever need arises. When this country needs to reassure an ally or deter a potential adversary, we can do that. When our nation needs to do the long, hard, unspectacular work of building partnerships with other countries, we can do that. When America and the world need to respond to a humanitarian catastrophe. We can do that. We can do all that because our equipment is flexible and fungible, because our forces have a zero land-based footprint, and we can maneuver because our forces and our equipment are together. When we are ordered by the President to meet some challenge on behalf of our nation, we don't have to negotiate, we don't have to wait for permission to land on somebody else's soil. We move on the seas that we control. The Navy and the Marine Corps were created as an expeditionary force, and we have remained so throughout our long and proud history. Being agile and being expeditionary is in our DNA. There are two vital components to any response, speed and staying power. Because we are globally deployed, we can get there fast. Because we are self-sustained, expeditionary, maritime force, we can stay for as long as it takes. Our forces also have the huge advantage of being able to converge or disperse to meet whatever situation or situations that arise. National policy increasingly shows us the need for such an expeditionary marine force. As the United States draws down its presence around the world, we become less reliant on land-based forces outside the continental United States, while intensifying challenges around the world increase the necessity for our Navy and Marine Corps' fast and flexible capabilities. The deliberations that are taking place at this conference come at a crucial time. For while we focus on operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have to also answer the call very eloquently expressed by our Secretary of Defense to look beyond the horizons. We must not only meet traditional security challenges posed by the military forces of other states, but also get ready for the important role we play in the struggle against violent extremism. We're in the midst of a rapidly changing security landscape and increasingly complex world. A world with rogue nations and failed states, insurgencies and terrorist groups, and the danger of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons added to this mix. In the light of all this, I can't think of a better theme for this symposium than considering how our Navy, how our country, can meet both the future challenges and identify opportunities to promote a more stable world. We have to be able to engage in irregular warfare in more conventional scenarios and the high-end asymmetric threats, while at the same time working to build trust 
as a deterrence to war. This is and has been the very definition of our naval forces. Since its birth, the United States has been a maritime nation whose security has de demanded a maritime solution. Piracy off the Horn of Africa, so recently in the news, reminds us of the 18th century Barbary pirates and the threat they posed to our fledgling nation. This concern was in the front of the minds of the delegates of the convention who met at Philadelphia to write a new constitution for our new republic. Armed with this new national authority, the United States commissioned six frigates built up and down the coast from New Hampshire to Virginia. And since those first six frigates, our enduring sea power has proven essential to countering threats, winning wars, and furthering the interests of peace and prosperity worldwide. When nearly 75% of our planet is covered by water, 80% of its inhabitants live near water, 90% of global commerce is transported by sea, and 95% of global communications go under the sea, we can see the immense importance of ensuring the freedom of those seas. Today, we are acutely aware of nations which may threaten the peace and stability of the world. But it's not only traditional nations that deserve our attention. Over the last few years, we've, we've witnessed the emergence of new non-traditional but very dangerous threats. The weapons used by non-state actors are just as lethal as those used by traditional nation states. Irregular warfare, insurgency, criminal activity, social unrest, low intensity civil conflicts have all proven as destabilizing as they are difficult to counter. But countering these and preparing for them, we must. As you know, and as the students here have been learning, we'll face a world that's even more complex than the one today. The trends we've got in demographics and climate change and globalization, immigration, resource availability, is going to intensify the strain on many of the world's nations. And many of these strains will be felt most acutely by nations who are the least equipped to deal with them and increase the potential for internal and external conflicts. Our sailors and our Marines will have to operate and succeed in this demanding environment of this future. All this brings us back to and reinforces the need for a maritime force which is powerful enough, inventive enough, and agile enough to do whatever the nation calls upon it to do. To make sure we continue to have this force, we've got to do several things. And I take all these very seriously. Our most important priority is to take care of our sailors and Marines and their families. As the President and as Secretary Gates has stated, and as we all know deep down, America's greatest military asset are the dedicated men and women who wear the uniform. They came from every corner of our country and all walks of life, yet they're bonded together by a calling to be on the front lines of freedom. Our sailors and Marines are called on to execute many and varied missions. They provide persistent forward presence. They project power in many ways, and they protect our sea lanes. They provide deterrence, and when necessary, they fight and they win. They serve as ambassadors of peace and partnership as they cooperate with foreign partners and allies, so many of whom are here today. They provide training and assistance and deliver humanitarian and disaster relief. We have to ensure that they get the training and the equipment that they need to do these many faceted jobs. Even as our service members are serving in Iraq and Afghanistan alongside their fellow soldiers and, and soldiers and airmen and Coast Guardsmen, the Navy and the Marine Corps team stands ready to answer our nation's call from the Gulf of Mexico to the Gulf of Aden. Despite our high operational tempo, our warriors remain resilient and motivated, and they're performing extraordinarily, extraordinarily well 
around the, around the world. Never forget that at the War College here, the deliberations are going to inform the strategies that the graduates and their, their colleagues will use to lead these brave and committed young men and women. Our country owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to all those who serve, but none more so than our wounded who have paid freedom's cost so dearly. We have a solemn duty to ensure that when we send our forces to fight, they know that the wounded, ill, and injured will have the best medical care available for body and mind, and their families back home will get the support they deserve. And while we rightly focus on those who serve, don't ever forget the families and the critical, too often overlooked role that they play. Next, we're going to continue to support our global commitments while making sure that we've got a force capable of meeting whatever challenges we may face in the future. We're going to prepare for irregular warfare and hybrid campaigns while maintaining our conventional warfare capabilities. Secretary of Defense has stressed rebalancing our force, reordering our priorities, and probably most important, resisting the thought process of the status quo. As he has said, we can't see the current world and our operations in Afghanistan and Iraq as aberrations, which, when they have ended, allow us to get back to what we were doing before. Our greatest weapon, greatest weapon we have, is our ability to think and to adjust and to provide the means to meet whatever comes, whatever's out there in the years ahead. As part of this, we're working on the Quadrennial Defense Review major examination of our strategy, how we design and deploy our forces. Again, to quote Secretary Gates, we can't have more of the same thinking simply presented in a new package. Along these lines, the Department of the Navy is going to work hard on the acquisition process and on all our existing programs to ensure that our sailors and Marines not only have the equipment that they need, but they receive it on time and on budget. The practices of relying on overly optimistic cost estimates and schedules just got to end. Requirements can't be ever-changing. Design can't happen at the same time as construction. The perfect cannot be the enemy of the good or the good enough. Our suppliers have to have reliability and stability. We cannot continue to have ever more complex, ever more exotic programs at ever higher cost with ever longer schedules and ever fewer end results. To continue down this path is in the end disarming ourselves. No matter how capable these new platforms and systems are, at some point numbers matter and quantity becomes quality. And as with our doctrine and our people, our equipment's got to be capable of shifting from one type of mission to another and of being able to be used for any type of engagement. Also, we've got to move toward greater energy independence ashore and afloat. Readily available energy is essential for deploying our sailors and Marines around the globe in support of our national interests. The energy for our missions has to be more secure, less volatile. Since our operational flexibility and sustainability directly linked to our energy supplies, energy reliability is a strategic concern for this force. The potential disruption of our nation's fuel supplies threatens our stability to perform our mission. We're going to move toward alternative energies for two reasons, security and diminishing our impact on the environment. We've made a lot of strides in increasing our energy efficiency, reducing our energy consumption, and capitalizing on renewable energy resources. Not only are we leading the Department of Defense in solar, geothermal, and ocean energy, but 17% of our total shore requirements for energy are provided through alternative or renewable means. But we have to do a lot more. We're going to have a comprehensive energy strategy to increase conservation develop alternative energy options, and provide for our energy security. 
Now, there's no doubt that our naval forces will always stand ready to fight for America through what is done here at the War College. We're going to remain on the cutting edge of the ideas we need to prevail against any eventuality. The Naval War College has been a leading source of strategic thought since its founding, 1884. Early in the history here, naval strategists wargamed a global conflict with Spain. The gaming floor in Newport saw the Pacific Island hopping campaign with its revolutionary amphibious logistics and carrier operations played out again and again during the 20s and 30s. So often was this done that Admiral Nimitz said after the end of World War II that there really were few strategic surprises during that war. The critical thought, tactical insight that reside here in the War College provide, have proved instrumental in developing the maritime strategy that we have used over the last century. Today, the students and the faculty here remain at the forefront of innovative thought and analysis as we confront a most demanding future. You're going to listen to an impressive array of speakers over the next two days, of which I'm undoubtedly the least talented. From top military commanders to some of the brightest minds in academic and policy circles, I think you'll find the current strategy forum to be enormously useful in understanding and confronting these challenges. This is going to be an interesting and exciting and I hope useful symposium for our civilian guests, and there are a lot of you. Take the insights that you've gained here and over the next couple of days back to your colleagues and your communities so that people get a fuller idea of what our Navy and Marine forces in particular are doing for our nation at this time. And to the War College students who are here and who are listening back at the War College, participate fully and listen closely. This symposium is a capstone event of your stay here, an opportunity to assimilate the many varied disciplines of your educational experience. You're going to need that education in the years ahead as you return to the fleet and to your other duty assignments. I want to thank the people in uniform for giving your time and your talent and your lives to your country. I want to congratulate the students here who are graduating this week on the successful completion of a really demanding course of study and say that we look forward to your future contributions to our country. Each of you in this room has lived a part of the dream that is quintessentially American. We have to make sure that the country that encourages dreams like this is well defended. Godspeed. Thank you.